Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Diseases in Epidemiology with me, Sophia J. So this is lesson two, so if you haven't watched lesson one, go back and watch that. But let's get on with lesson two. So today we're going to talk about his, the historical evolution of epidemiology. So once again, all information is from the CDC. Well, let's get started. So the evolution of epidemiology. I've put like a kind of rough timeline here. And if you can see, we start from circa 400 BC to now. Well, epidemiology has been around for more than 2000 years. So, but let's take a look at each of these points in between that I have on this timeline. So over here, I've put a few names. You might recognize a few, Hippocrates, John Grant, William Farr, John Snow. And these are all important figures in the development of epidemiology as a field because epidemiology really like took off after World War II and like inventions such as the microscope. So you can actually see bacteria and all that. But be even before, the invention of the microscope, epidemiology was still used to quantify diseases. So this is just a broad timeline, but we're gonna go into each of these people in debt and their contributions to the field. So we start from the very beginning, circa 400 BC. So this is when Hippocrates was especially important because he published his paper on airs, waters, and places, which basically took the stance of attempting to explain disease occurrence from a rational rather than a supernatural point of view. So it's for the first time that we're saying diseases are caused by something other than just the gods, for example. And then it brought up the question, well, what is causing these diseases? And of course, you know, these are the crucial questions that we want answered when we are doing any epidemiological study. So next we have John Grant in 1662. John Grant published a landmark analysis of mortality data that year. And what he did was he took this mortality data and he and he analyzed it. For the first time, somebody looked at the distributions of birth, distributions of death, and distributions of disease. And not only that, he noted disparities between like disease occurrence in males and females, between urban and rural areas, and like between the seasons as well. And William Farr in in the in eighteen hundred furthered Grant's work, and he collected and analyzed Britain's mortality statistics from the years leading up to the eighteen hundreds, and he developed many of the basic practices that we use today in statistics. Because once again, epidemiology is statistics because we have to analyze the data that we have. So practices such as practices in vital statistics and disease classification. And next we're going to talk about John Snow. Now John Snow is a particularly important person and you'll probably hear him be referred to as the father of modern epidemiology, father of epidemiology, father of field epidemiology, because he really is sort of the figure who started it all. Everyone before him, yes, they made contributions, but back then it was just, oh, we're analyzing this, and they haven't really put together the steps of epidemiology, which I have outlined here. So the basic steps that John Snow outlined were one, descriptive epidemiology, two, hypothesis generation, three, hypothesis testing, and four, application. So let's take a look at what John Snow did that was so impactful. And what he did was he figured out the cause of cases of cholera. 
1854, there was an epidemic of cholera. An epidemic just means like an abnormally high number of cases in a certain amount of time in a sort of localized area. So that localized area was the Golden Square of London. And what Jon Snow did was he recognized that there was a lot of cases of cholera going around and he determined where in the Golden Square of London people with cholera lived and where they worked. And he marked each of their residences on a map, which we have right over here. Now this map we call a spot map because it's a type of map that shows the geological distribution of cases and he uses spots. If there are spots that are more cluttered than others, then you know the distribution. So his hypothesis, his why, was that he believed that water was a source of infection for cholera. So he marked the location of water pumps on the spot map. So we have pump A, pump B, another pump, pump C, another pump. So he looked for a relationship between the distribution of houses with cholera and the location of the pumps. And his results were that there were more case households cluttered around pump A than pump B or pump C or any the other two pumps. So he concluded that pump A was the primary source of water and most likely the source of infection. And to confirm, because overall he just did look at a map, after all, he still has to find another way to back up his data, Snow gathered information on where the persons of cholera had obtained their water. Because just because you live close by doesn't mean you will take water from it. So it's good that he went this extra step to confirm. And he concluded that consumption of water of consumption of water from pump A was the one common factor among cholera patients. So that had to be the determinant, the risk factor. So Snow reported his findings and the pump was removed and the outbreak ended. This is such a great example of what epidemiology can do. It can help you determine the cause of a disease. And once you figured out that cause, it is so much more beneficial to the general population because you can prevent that disease from spreading more. And not only did John Stowe do that one experiment in 1854, but he also revisited it a few years later because he also noted that districts with the highest cholera death rates were serviced by two water companies, the Lambeth Company and the Southward and Vaxhall Company. So he, he went around and he found out that both companies obtained water from the Thames River, a river that runs through London. However, what was different between the two companies were that Lambeth takes their water upstream from London and southward and Vauxhall takes water downstream. So his hypothesis was that water obtained from the Thames below London was a source of cholera. But here we see a table of the mortality from cholera in districts of London supplied by the SNV and Lebeth companies. So over here, we have the total population, we have the number of deaths from cholera, and we also have an additional column called cholera death rate per 1,000 population. Because if you take a look at this data, we see that so many more people are being serviced by the SNV company. And yet there are also more deaths from cholera. So if we just take those two numbers separately, we can't really say that means taking water downstream is more helpful because there's more deaths from cholera. We can't say that because there are more people being serviced by them. So it really isn't a good comparison to make in that case, which is why the extra column is here per 1000 population. So here 5.0 and 0 0.9, those are comparable numbers. And that's exactly what Jon Snow compared. 
he, he realized that the cholera death rate was more than five times higher in districts served by only SMB than those served only by Lambeth. And the mortality rate in districts supplied by both companies fell between the rates for districts served exclusively by either company, as we can see here. And this could either support the hypothesis or it could because, be because of another factor because once again, there is nothing to compare it to. So you can't make a solid conclusion about it. So what Jon Snow did next was that he looked at the water supply of each individual house. Because even if you are living in a district that's serviced by both companies, it's not necessarily it doesn't mean that each house is serviced by both companies. Each house is can only be serviced by one company. So Jon Snow took used that to his advantage and he got some more data. So once again, we have the total population, we have the number of deaths from cholera, and we have the cholera death rate. And over here, we can see 4.2, 0 0.5, using those two comparable numbers. The SNV houses are so much more likely to have deaths from cholera. So that this, along with the previous data, support his hypothesis that water taken downstream from the from London and the Thames River would be a risk factor for cholera because of the sewage. So if we take a look at the steps for epidemiology again and how John Snow applied them in his experiments, we see number one, descriptive epidemiology. He characterized the case and population at risk by time, place, and person. And he generated his hypothesis that the sewage and water could transmit cholera. And then he tested that hypothesis by comparing the SMV and Lambeth groups with each other using comparable numbers. And he then applied his knowledge of this and made efforts to change the intake location of SNV to avoid contamination. So Jon Snow, he was many, many years ago and epidemiology has only grown from that point on. It's now been applied to an entire range of health related outcomes, behaviors, and even knowledge and attitudes. In 1950, Dolan Hill linked lung cancer to smoking. I mean, who would have thought of that even happening without epidemiology? And in 1960s and the early 1970s, healthcare workers eradicated naturally occurring smallpox worldwide. And in 1980s, epidemiology was extended to the studies of injuries and violence and it's only continuing to grow. If we take a look at what's happened in the years in our recent past, we know that viruses and infections have been really on the center of people's minds because new infectious diseases, they keep on coming. We got rid of smallpox, but then now here's COVID. So some examples of these new infectious diseases are the Ebola virus, HIV, and Legionella, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, uh, drug-resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis, and avian influenza. Epidemiology is definitely a growing field. So that brings us to the end of the class today and i would just like to say thank you for listening to this i know it's not as interesting as learning how to analyze the data yourself for example but it's really cool to know how epidemiology started where it is now and where it could be at in the future so thank you and don't forget to subscribe so we can continue making 
educational resources just like these. And leave a comment below if there is a topic or area of study that you're really interested in, because who knows, we might add a course on later on that speaks about it. So I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Bye.